my husband is so not impressed that your name's Dallas because his first baby mama's name is Dallas and he's just he's getting post-traumatic stress disorder every time I'm like well I'm gonna go talk to Dallas he's like god damn it <laughs> oh my god <laughs> Hi, folks. Welcome to the Beloved Presence podcast. Today, um, I talk with Dallas Corshain, and we talk for an hour about a lot of different stuff. Um, he spends about half an hour uh, sharing his vision and ideas for Indigenous economic sovereignty, um, and then things get a little magical and wild about half an hour in, and it it was it's a it was amazing it was really an amazing uh interaction and i hope that dallas and i are able to continue together um uh with our vision for for sharing so check it out i have listed in the description um like all the timestamps, just kind of where stuff happens if you wanted to jump around and and look at stuff there's a lot of links to further resources and education if you're interested. If you like this, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Uh, we're just kind of starting out uh, again and uh, it really helps if you like this kind of thing to spread it out and help to grow the community. If you're interested in being a guest on either the Beloved Presence podcast or uh, the Virtual Turtle Lodge uh, with Dallas and I, Please get in contact with me. Just message me through through here, through social media, or uh, at my email, leslie at lesliedavidson.com. I'm interested in knowing what your vision is for Turtle Island, for ongoing uh, reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples um, of Turtle Island. I, I really want to have those conversations and share that um, kind of information and those perspectives. That's very important to me and part of my vision um, for why I'm here <laughs> this time around. So I'd really like you to, um, to share, share in the comments, contact me directly, contact Alice. This is really important stuff. It's really important. If you know of people who would be interested in this, please share. Uh, please encourage them to contact me to be invited on the podcast as well. Like I'm, I'm very, very, very open and encouraging and I'm inviting everyone who wants to have these conversations to come have them with us. So Dallas is the founder of the Rise Up Initiative. Uh, link is in the description. It's basically a free online education portal for Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples alike to uh, learn more about reconciliation and the truth of our history and dispelling myths uh, that we have inherited without reflection regarding uh, indigenous peoples on Turtle Island and our shared history. He's also very, uh, very passionate and dedicated to helping to build economic sovereignty and uh, independence for his people and encouraging uh, indigenous communities to reach out in business partnership and research and development uh, in sustainable technologies, all of which is uh, important for, for indigenous communities' economic independence, but also for Turtle Island sustainability and for ongoing stewardship of our environment. So it was great talking with Dallas. Uh, I, I had a spiritual, um, <laughs> emotional connection to the, to our meeting. Um, it's very, it was spirit led for sure. And, um, I'm, I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. So thanks for being here. Um, I've been like obviously following you on TikTok and watching what you've been doing, um, which has been really really actually helpful and integral for my own um, kind of healing path and my own vocational path. You've actually delivered some really 
um, valuable nuggets for me to find my own way. So I'm really grateful to you personally for that. Um, and for me, I'd like you to talk to me if you could about like your vision, um, and how it includes the, the rise up initiative, what your vision is for the, sorry, this is a lot. Tell me what your vision for the future of Canada is Dallas. Like <laughs> calm down, Leslie, calm down. But that's kind of uh, that's kind of what I'm interested in. I want to like, like I'm really interested in what you see happening and and what in particular you see, um, like settlers' role in that. Like, what can we do to be part of that and not get in the way and you know that kind of thing. So, gotcha. Uh, with the Rise Up Initiative, what I envision for the Rise Up Initiative is that basically over the past uh, over 20 years or so, I've went on a own personal journey to um, figure out why I felt the way I did, like why I dealt, dealt with the uh, trauma such as battling addiction, suicide, well, not addiction, but that's not until later on in life, but suicide primarily and depression, right? So I went through like this entire journey and out of it, I had this vision that I could bring this knowledge to not only Indigenous people here in Canada, but North America worldwide. And I started noticing that in our healing and, and uh, elim- uh, basically addressing the effects of ongoing colonialism, such as uh, economic disparities, uh, various other um, uh, systemic racism that, that still proliferates a lot of the systems, that by through education and through me bringing this knowledge to my people that we can start crafting our own solutions to address the very issue that uh, not only plague our communities, but are often the pain points for society where they say like we get uh, free money or we are, you know, 30% of us are in the uh, make up the prison population here in Canada are indigenous 30% of the prison population. So it's these facts that people see from a distance and they kind of make these um, assumptions because there's missing information. There's uh, that lack of understanding where in regards to uh, our traditional ways of life that have been taken away from us, that in the restoration of these ways, indigenous sovereignty, uh, our traditional ways, ceremonies, because our ceremonies are actually what constitute our sovereignty. That's what makes us, uh, constitutes our nationhood. And when the residential schools took those away, that was basically replacing that with the Indian Act. And through our sovereignty, we can actually utilize the laws that are inherent in every nation on Earth to create uh, an economic uh, prosperity that that we Indigenous have not seen in Turtle Island you know, since the onset of the colonization. But it's through these uh, mechanisms that if Canadians were to support uh, Indigenous sovereignty, our right to just not, not, that doesn't mean that we own Canada. What it means is that Indigenous sovereignty simply means that we have jurisdiction over the laws over reserve land, over lands that are unceded, the lands that are um, basically uh, for Treaty 1 territory. It would be, you know, the reserve land that we have. We would have no jurisdiction over or laws over uh, power over any laws in Canada. But we'd simply be able to make the laws on our land, such as hemp laws. In Canada, it's very, very restrictive to grow and process hemp and sell it on the market in Canada. Uh, with our own laws, we'd be able to grow, say, marijuana for medicinal purposes, cannabis for medicinal purposes, and create an industry from that. Piggybacking on that, create a hemp creed industry, which would provide low-cost housing, addressing the housing crisis within First Nation communities with hemp creed, which is mold, mold-proof, fireproof, pest-proof, and is um, actually sequesters carbon whilst reducing energy consumption every year. So it is win-win all the way around. These sorts of uh, innovations and collaborations I envision for the Rise Up Initiative in bringing not only the knowledge that we need, but also creating the systems and creating the collaborations and relationships that are needed to make these things a reality. In the future, I see, I foresee for example, um, if we get into this uh, hempcrete and um, other innovations with uh, hemp and marijuana uh, cannabis, what we can actually do is create uh, 
like research and development facilities on our land where we actually gather support to fund hemp based battery innovation for example mm. like this stuff is uh is um superior to lithium there's an uh, an, an event a group of inventors that developed this hemp battery that doesn't require heavy metals such as nickel or cobalt which means the cobalt mining in uh in congo that can literally come to an end within 10 years if we had the basically the awareness that we as indigenous peoples under our sovereign lawmaking abilities are moving towards ending dependency on outside funding, whether it be treaty obligations or social assistance from the Canadian government. What I envision is indigenous communities able to self-sustainably uh, rely upon our own economic uh, in industrial opportunities, which are environmentally sustainable, which actually benefit the environment and actually leave something behind for future generations where we're not dependent upon outside funding, where we're self-sufficient and where we can actually then be in a position to provide, uh, contribute value to the economies of the Canadian and uh, U.S. Uh, economy. So I see it as the way Canadians can support us is uh, recognizing our um, what we can achieve if we had sovereignty recognized in Canada and the United States, if our law making abilities on our, over our lands, not over any other Canadians or any other peoples, but just over the lands, we would be able to not only create economic prosperity, but the issues that are caused by the residential schools that are caused by ongoing colonization. This I found in all my research to be the most effective way that would on a mass scale alleviate the problems associated with intergenerational trauma caused by the residential schools, such as domestic abuse, um, crime rates, addiction, these issues have a cause. And if we address the underlying issues, which is that lack of identity, lack of a uh, sense of uh, community, sense of belonging and purpose, when we restore our ceremonies, our ways of life, our sovereignty, and we have and our people see that we actually can make a difference in our lives, that we have the ability, structural ability to actually do these things. I can almost guarantee that you would see a dramatic shift in not only uh, our people, but in Canadian society in general, as attitudes begin to shift, as we start to realize that there are so what we previously thought was true about one another even is actually not true at all. That through doing these things, achieving these external uh, successes, that we can forge a new relationship, new understanding of where we can go, not only as you know, as uh, uh, nations, but as treaty partners and as a global uh, humanity, as a family, human family together, uh, because what affects us affects everyone. We have to recognize that the web of life is, you know, it's, you know, for example, our smartphones is contributing to the genocide in Congo, right? Like there's nothing that we don't do that doesn't have ripple effects to everyone and everything around us. And we got to start recognizing this sacredness of life, reconnecting the spirit, which is something that we all need to do as, you know, is, is, uh, is another thing uh, sellers can do to help us is also reconnect with their own sense of uh, spirituality, their own sense of identity outside of these colonial constructs. Like we have an opportunity to create a new identity for all of us, one that we all are proud to call, you know, this is who we are, right? Okay, let me let me jump in for a sec because I have a couple questions. One okay. is, the first one is specifically, how do settlers support um sovereignty for indigenous nations because i'm 100 percent on board i've been on board you don't need to convince me i'm here but what like what do i do like how like what do we do to help because i don't know what to do and the second is um 
maybe that's enough. Maybe start there. You can answer that question because yeah, that's I have big, a lot of questions for you. By the and I want to ask just before we continue, why are you called McCoons? I know this. I just took it oh. way off course, but like I wanted to ask that first. Why are you called McCoons? And can I call you Dallas, or what do you want to be yeah. called? Either or, you call me Dallas. Um, McCoons is my spear name. It means little bear. Uh, it's a name that I've gotten oh. when I was about five years old, I think. Okay. But I had it all my life, so that's my spirit name. Is, that's uh, who I am. <laughs> oh, okay, beautiful. Thank you. I had no idea. Thank you. Um, okay, yeah. So, what what do what do settlers need to do to support Indigenous sovereignty? Because, like, I was listening to a podcast called The Salmon People. And there was a moment when um, BC nations, sovereign indigenous nations sat on the same side of the table with the provincial government as two sovereign governments regulating industry. And I cried because that's the vision I hold for Canada. That's the vision. I think that we have the best possible future, especially environmentally, if uh, indigenous nations are sovereign and work in partnership with provincial federal governments together equal on the same table regulating industry but anyway so what do we do what do we do the major <laughs> step would be um i uh this is right up my alley because uh, uh i like figuring out problems but one of the uh tools that we can use uh, i i learned from the book the influencer the power to change anything and in order to change anything and to sustain that change, it is required basically uh, six factors of change. Um, but basically, in a nutshell, you need to identify two to three key behaviors you want people to emulate. You got to give the social rewards for it and the structural ability for people to engage in those behaviors. So the behaviors that we need right now, uh, first and foremost, would be awareness, advocacy. People need to be aware what Indigenous sovereignty means, the fact that we are nations and what nationhood actually represents, and furthermore, what Indigenous sovereignty, if properly utilized, what it could represent not only for Indigenous nations, but also Canada and the GDP as, as Canada as a whole, like in regards to if we're able to get atmospheric water generators, uh, energy, food, and, you know, indoor vertical farms that are automated that provide hemp and also even food, like we would become not only an asset to um, our own communities, but nearby towns and cities that, right, we reduce the transportation of fresh produce. I mean, that's that's at the bottom line of every single Canadian. They would directly benefit uh, in many different ways. So advocacy would be the primarily uh, the, the first key behavior, I think, would be uh, first and foremost. So uh, there would have to be ways of um, basically communicating and and building awareness of what can be achieved through indigenous sovereignty if fully recognized and realized to this full potential um i've been trying to do that in my own way like whether through on tiktok and whatnot but if there were to be uh, a way for um, non-indigenous peoples to help uh that would be i guess involve a coordinated effort because again like there's so many moving parts there's so many indigenous nations that that are separate from each other. So they make their own laws. They have their own customs and their own yeah. ways of dealing with stuff. So we have to kind of be mindful and respectful of their territories and their jurisdictions as well. Right. So it would have to be uh, on our side, indigenous peoples is the onus again, kind of falls on us in a way, in a, in a huge way for us to actually uh, lay out, you know, this is what our aims are. This is what we want to accomplish. This is what we, envision under indigenous sovereignty if canadians were to like say we were to um petition for a referendum in canada to be held to recognize indigenous sovereignty that we have full control over the, the full control over the indian act the protections therein but we then take the time to make our own laws that basically provide the same protections of the indian act whilst enabling us control over uh, the relationship uh, over our lands, how Canada treats us and how we engage on a nation to nation basis with Canada, where there may be possible disputes in the future in regards to um, land or resources or um, basic infrastructure, like maintaining of a, of a certain infrastructure, for example, if that's applicable. Yeah. 
so you would not want to eliminate the Indian Act. You would want to reform the Indian Act. No, um, uh, Indigenous sovereignty would be basically well, what I, what I was explaining was um, the 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 reason why we have the Indian Act, um, and we don't get rid of it. There's a lot of uh, debate around that. A lot of people say yeah. we gotta get rid of the Indian Act, which is true. <laughs> Which okay. is true. We need indigenous sovereignty. We need uh, to be able to have control over our destinies. But at the same time, on the on the same token, at the same hand, on the same hand, we have the fact that the Indian Act provides us legal protections. That, for example, the uh, Capion Barracks in Winnipeg, Manitoba, uh, we recently acquired that land uh, as a result of Indian Act provisions. There was uh, uh, stipulated that any land that was not um, basically um, utilized by the Canadian government that we would have first shot instead of them uh, putting up for bid for sale auction, that we would have the first chance at acquiring the, that land, right? And Capion Barracks had to be unused for several years of military uh, uh, barracks used for, and it was unused. So for several years, and they put up for auction, but then Treaty 1 stepped in and said, no, actually, Indian Act states that you can't sell this land, that you have to consult with us first, and we have to have first shot at acquiring it if we so choose so we did that and we acquired that uh urban reserve in winnipeg so that's producing the first one on madison for example produce a incredible amount of revenue for our reservations because those tax-free gas uh for first nations they would come to us and we would um not only did we uh have excellent customer service right that's why they came they would drive across town just to be uh, service there at the, at our gas station on Madison, but um, we brought a lot of business, right? We the income generated, right, from our businesses and our employment when we do these sorts of things, these economic endeavors, they they benefit Canadians directly. The bottom line, we go to towns to spend our our money, right? right. So yeah, so all these uh, it may seem like like oh they don't pay taxes, I guess an unfair advantage. In reality, in exchange, Canada gets to exist as a country. We all get to benefit and share the land and resources. It was originally intended was that that was the point of uh, the treaties, was that we'd have a way to peacefully coexist that it protected each other's interests, right? And Indigenous sovereignty, without that, we cannot fully protect our own interests based on our nationhood, based on our ways of life, based on our laws. So... Yeah, it's, uh, I forget where we're going. I kind of, I don't, I don't know. Off. We're, we're like, we're going here. Um, okay. So I just thought of another question. I don't, I didn't really want to talk about this, but I am interested in your response. If, um, say a Canadian would say, I don't want Indigenous people to have sovereignty because it's going to be a competition for my own business. They're going to be competition and have, like you said, unfair advantage. By the way, I don't I don't agree with this. I'm just bringing it up because I, I want to know kind of what these arguments, how they can be handled for my own yeah, exactly. self when they come up. Exactly. I, I totally agree with you. It's, it's a very valid point, too. It's a very valid concern. I mean, um, at, at hindsight, you know, first glance, it could look like that uh, we come there and scoop up business because, right, we get, uh, you know, tax advantages or various other uh, um, benefits. Um, but the way I see it is that the industry that I envision that can happen through indigenous sovereignty wouldn't be simply, you know, like put up a new Walmart. Like we're never, never going to have that kind of um, uh, pull in society. Right. Like the, the best we, uh, the, the best case scenario I envision would be that we utilize our, say, for example, to build a research and development facility for hemp batteries, right? A hundred million dollar facility, for example, built, Anywhere else, they have to, number one, acquire the land. Uh, it has to be proper zoning. It has to abide by several other regulations, city regulations. However, under Indigenous sovereignty, where we can control the laws of the land on reserve land, we would be able to allocate certain land for research and development. Tax-free, $100 million would equal about $14 million in savings. That $14 million can go towards a hempcrete facility that can produce, um, for example, a thousand homes a year 
at, you know, we get the uh, retainer. Basically, we get reserves that get 10-year block funding for housing. And we say, okay, we have X amount of houses that we can provide you if you provide that those funds up front so we can right then expand into other things and stuff. But this is the ultimate vision is that we would be able to lower the cost of building construction, housing for all Canadians, lower the cost of living, right? These ulti ultimately the high strategic areas where indigenous sovereignty would produce the most benefits would uh, sure assuredly offset any possible competition that would arise from say indigenous building their own business in direct competition to smaller owned businesses that overall the cost of living that we can actually lower, you know, cost of building houses uh, through hempcrete housing, you know, hemp-based batteries over time, plant-based solar panels. The, those are way off in the future. Like, you know, yeah, it shows the sky high, but tangible today, hempcrete housing, we can achieve that. We can lower the cost of building and construction. And housing is a huge thing in Canada right now. They say by 2025, there's going to be a housing crisis. Well, First Nations, our communities, if we had the ability to uh, make our own laws, make our own, um, um, basically shed the Indian Act in a way that we don't lose the protections of the Indian Act, such as, uh, so, yeah, that's why I mentioned Capion Barracks, is that we were able to acquire that through these legal protections that the Indian Act provides. Uh, we would need a framework. Sovereignty would be that framework, Indigenous sovereignty. But we would have to basically assure that over time we phase out the Indian Act and it becomes 100% Indigenous di directed and our and our interests, interests are protected just as much as Canadian interests are. And I believe that's the best way of going forward because you mentioned, you know, business owners, they, they might have, you know, concerns about possible uh, conflicts of uh, like, like competition might be like too much or whatever because we have these, uh, perceived advantages i would think that having an open discussion with canadians talking about indigenous sovereignty if that we have the ability to make our own laws like would canadians support that in the sense of what i just described hempcrete housing that the conversation if it was changed instead of saying like oh you know this guy's uh, going to have a competition over you the conversation should be more of what can this provide for all Canadians as a whole, you know, cost of living wise, housing, everything else. Like we should be looking at as an opportunity ra rather than as competition because people would say in capitalistic society as well, they owe competition is healthy. So that's another well, argument as well. That I saw. <laughs> you, you, you made a point where you said, Oh, we would be like indigenous sovereignty. We would have protections like, like Canadians do, but I'll be honest with you, my I don't feel that my rights are protected by my governments right now because they do not care about natural resources in the way that I assume Indigenous sovereignty would care about natural resources. And that's an assumption that I'm making that maybe is it accurate or not accurate? Like, that's part of my desire for Indigenous sovereignty is the understanding that it would be stewarded in a sustainable way and wouldn't be perceived as the value coming only from it providing profit to industry and capitalism. Exactly. That's, uh, I'm glad. Uh, that's a great point, too, because... If we had control over our laws of our lands, we would be able to prevent um, harmful industry. For example, uh, the copper mines in BC. There were uh, there's a couple of copper mines in BC that are known for uh, you know the copper industry itself is very environmentally destructive. While the nations over there, the native nations there, um, basically held them account and prevented a lot of uh, environmental. Uh, um, devastation by holding them accountable and making sure that their practices adhere to the highest standards in the world. So that's an example of what Indigenous sovereignty can achieve uh, as well. Uh, I only talk in means of capitalistic uh, uh, self-sustainability because um, our economic economic uh, uh, prosperity is integral to Indigenous sovereignty. We cannot have sovereignty unless we have the ability to produce our own hospitals, to produce our own schools 
and to fund uh, the doctors uh, there and the teachers there and to be able to basically take care of ourselves as a nation. We have to unfortunately do that until the point where I ultimately envision the resources that we have. We no longer even have to deal with money, right? That we'd be producing enough uh, products that we can trade, we can buy, uh, uh, either trade with other indigenous nations worldwide, globally, or, right, we could have these things refined. And basically, we can basically operate without money. That if the economic system were to collapse or the energy grid were to collapse, that or climate change affect water, crops, all of that, we would remain untouched and be able to provide as a safety buffer in the rest of North American society in the event of, say, one year a drought just absolutely devastates the, the crops due to climate change. We would be in a position where we would have those resources to provide that without the need for money, that we can provide that free of charge because we have so much abundance. And that's ultimately what the vision of Indigenous sovereignty is, is that we outgrow the need for money altogether. But until we can get to that point, we have to utilize the resources available to us, one of which is monetary needs. Uh, economic prosperity is is one of them. So the yeah, only I reason why I talk I about yeah. that's not even a question. I don't I don't disagree with that or question that at all. I think that's a, just a standard foundation for sovereignty yeah. is to have economic independence for sure. Um, um, I, why would indigenous nations once sovereign and, um, profitable and independent have any interest in helping the rest of North America? Like why, why it, would they? It's our way of life is uh, our ceremonies. Our nationhood is based, uh, like I mentioned earlier, is based on our ceremonies. And when one connects to the land and connects to the spirit through ceremony, they naturally and cannot help but think about everyone and the interconnectedness of, uh, of all life. That's why our my ancestors, in the first place, were always friendly to settlers, always wanted them uh, to exist here, co coexist peacefully. Whereas, you know, that was never the intention of uh, the original colonizers that brought well-meaning settlers, but used them as pawns to basically colonize the land for them and take control of large swaths of land. So but that's why I think uh, that my people would not only think about that, but in a way, it is uh, many Indigenous prophecies talk about this day, right? When my generation would rise up in defense of the land, and we would serve as an example, not only for uh, the rest of the world, but we would provide the means to actually unite with all colors of all uh, peoples of this planet to basically not only protect uh, Mother Earth, but enrich Mother Earth to provide future generations a more sustainable lifestyle that we're coming to a crossroads and we're at that crossroads right now where humanity has that ability to make that decision right now to continue on the path we're on right now or join us in a new way, a new vision for humanity that includes all life, not just, you know, the for capitalistic means or one person or one race or one nation, but everyone. Yeah. I mean, that's why I reached out to you is... Um... Uh, my own path of ancestral healing has led me directly to um, land as the first teacher and indigenous knowledge is the only way forward. Like it's, it's literally the only way that I can follow my vocation in this life, which is literally a spiritual calling for this. Um, so what I assume that I'm not the only one. I assume that European immigrants, similar to myself, who are doing ancestral healing work, who are reconnecting to their Celtic roots, pre-Christian Celtic roots, on Turtle Island are having this same understanding that the only education um, that is suitable for us going forward is land as first teachers, indigenous knowledge. Like, what do we... 
what do we do? <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm sorry that I keep asking you that. It's like, I'm, I'm, I'm being led. I am being led to resources. I am learning like what I'm needing to learn, but I would like, I feel that I'm sorry. I'm talking a lot now about me. Um, I feel that my role is to help bridge this for Celtic reconnecting people. There are so many similarities between Celtic pre pre Christian Celtic culture and indigenous culture. The similarities are so sim like they're so. It's very very similar. I'm not saying it's the same, but there are very very similar um, beliefs and cultural practices that for me to to connect to my Celtic culture on Turtle Island my allyship is for indigenous sovereignty my allyship is for promoting um, indigenous leadership and indigenous stewardship over the land because um, Celtic culture is just as connected to land to a Danannan means the land and the people of Danu like that land and people is the same word in Irish. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, this is like, this is just what I've been coming to understand. And I've always had a connection to and a resonance with um, like indigenous culture as I've come into contact with it. Um, but I also think that until European descendants, specifically of Celtic heritage, until we connect to our own roots there is like an appropriation of indigenous knowledge when it's not rooted in our own cultural roots and language where we're not connect. I don't know if I'm being clear, but this is, this is just what I've been learning myself on my own journey is that I didn't know what to do with indigenous resonance until I connected to Celtic heritage and to Celtic culture. Then I understood where that resonance was coming from. Do you know what okay. I mean? And I could be, yeah. I could be a support too, and I could learn from, it wasn't a taking to myself, the roots of your people. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that's a big difference. Yeah. Totally understand. Um, I guess the best way, the simplest way I could understand it in my context would be, spirit is uh it transcends religion it transcends uh race creed everything spirit is uh the core essence like for example some indigenous nations might have different ceremonies but our way to connecting with the land connecting with the spirit right that's all that inherently is is what is priorities our ability to do that so um what i uh based on what you're does telling me my late elder dave christian jr had a vision of uh, the turtle lodge and the turtle lodge was <sighs> to be built around the world uh these turtle lodges would be built around the world and to be connected to the main lodge in uh, port alexander here in treaty one territory and this lodge these lodges they're meant for all colors all nations to come together to share each other's knowledge and primarily to learn from indigenous ways of life however it is so that's what the main focus is for indigenous ways of life to be uh presented and shared with our ceremonies shared with uh, the people and our ways of life uh shared openly with the people and that uh, we also come together with uh, uh various other spiritual leaders and practices that we allow uh the the sharing of our cultures in a new way of our spirits in a new way and I'm thinking this is kind of what you're looking for would be is something that you're looking for because if we had like a spear lodge, say in like one in every state, one in every province, and we start expanding worldwide with these spear lodges, there'll be a way to connect them via you know Zoom conference where where people who are in North America that have no way to reconnect with say their, their uh, Celtic roots, that there would be say a spear lodge built over there. And uh, a turtle lodge uh, built over there where they would be able to, right, have yeah. their elders and their knowledge shared with us, right, and our practices yeah. shared in, in that way. So I'm thinking that, that these uh, turtle lodges are actually uh, uh, really integral to a lot of uh, what's happening. Well, when I told you, oh, I'm being led and I'm finding resources, turtle lodge was the resource that I meant. I have really? just recently, yes. 
Um, and I'm, I might cut this out because I don't know whether I'm prepared to talk about this publicly right now. Is David Corsheen a like a relative of yours or just no. an elder? No, he's uh, no relation. The Corsheen family, we are uh, okay. very big. Are right? you very like big? A, okay. Yeah, it's, it's like uh, it's like the last name Smith to Indigenous people. Okay. So there's a lot of people with <laughs> Corsheen. Okay. Yeah. Um, Corsheen is like this is the Smith name of uh, Indigenous in, in Fort Alexander Treaty One. So. Okay. Um, can I tell you about something that just happened then? Uh, I I'm very nervous about telling this because it's it's fucking weird. Sorry, do you do you curse Dallas? Do you yeah, swear? Yeah. Okay, yes. good. Yeah, no problem. Like I do. I have a potty mouth, but um it's, it's just fucking weird, Dallas, what's happening. I have over the past eight months gone public with the fact that I talk to the dead. I have my whole life, um, but I didn't do it publicly because it wasn't something that was supported growing up. My mom's quite afraid of it. Other people, you know, it's not normal. You're weird. Like it's not, some people can be very uh, just unsupportive of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but I have um, been guided to go public with that recently and have started to offer the services and do readings for people. And it's being received really positively. People love knowing that dead isn't stopping, that people go on. So um, I watched a video with David Krishin and I thought it was the seven sacred laws video where he's talking about the seven sacred laws. And I thought, oh, it would be great to talk to him. And he said, you can. And I was like, come on. <laughs> but I, a few days ago, um, had a conversation with David Christian, who is, how do you pronounce his spirit name? It's Ni Ganiaki Ininin. Close. Um, I, my pronunciation too is very, very. Uh, yeah, you probably pronounce it better than I can. Uh, but yeah, uh, leading Earthman is, uh, is leading uh, Earthman. Yeah, Earth Man. Yeah, leading Earthman. And um, I call him Doctor Dave. Um, and he was okay with that. I'm really emotional about it because it's like, it's fucking weird, right? Um. And it's also, he is the teacher that I've been waiting for for years. And I assumed that he would be in a body when I, when I met, when I was ready for that teacher. But I also wouldn't have been able to probably learn from him until he released his body. So um, he's told me that what I do is called sacred listening. And um that's what I'm doing for Celtic culture on Turtle Island is sacred listening for our culture and how it roots here on this land. Cause we're not connecting to Ireland. We're not connecting to Scotland. We're connecting as Celts on Turtle Island. And so that's what I'm doing. And he is teaching me. And I don't know if that's okay. Like, I just, I'm very nervous about sharing that because, um, like, I, I asked him, I'm like, is this okay? Because, like, I'm, you know, I'm a settler. I'm I'm white. I'm, you know, I'm not. And he, he's, he's like, that's, that's why this is important. That's why this, this is necessary. That's why we're doing this is to, and I wanted to ask you before we started, if you would, um, do ceremony with me before we started this conversation because he's been teaching me about ceremony and you started off with ceremony you started off speaking about ceremony and I was like darn it I was gonna say that in the beginning for us to start on with ceremony because he he taught that ceremony um, can can heal everything he said ceremony solves everything and he was explaining to me what ceremony meant um, and it's like, it's making things sacred. 
it's making relationships sacred. And I'm sorry, I'm not here to teach any any Indigenous person anything, okay? I'm here to learn. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm here to sit and learn. That's what I'm in relationship with, um, with Indigenous individuals and nations about. I'm here to learn and then deliver that understanding of laws on Turtle Island to Celtic reconnecting people to European immigrant descendant seekers. I just want gotcha. that to be really clear. That is actually a very great initiative. I mean, there's nothing like that ever that has ever existed. I think that's very important. But exact what you're talking about, uh, late Dave Crochet Jr., um, that's in line with um what he teaches. Uh everything that you that you mentioned is actually on point. Um especially with uh with ceremony and uh and uh land and reconnecting, like all the uh uh, there was one point in particular I just kind of lost my train of thought on it, but it was something that you mentioned that, uh, that I wanted to draw attention to that that I felt was important. But in any event, oh, I think I believe that he is indeed talking with you because that's what. Oh, yeah, that's right. When he mentioned that, you know, this that's why this is important is because that's what he he uh, I'm saying envisioned with the Turtle Lodge and back when I was. Uh, he wanted to mentor me. This was this was uh, quite some time ago, over we thirteen years ago, and he wanted to mentor me. And and back then, um, I thought too much with my mind, right? I he told me that the longest path, uh, and and I know it was a quote from somewhere else, but it's true. Uh, but what he said was that the longest path man takes is from his mind to his heart, and at the time, I thought like, well, no, this is the solution. I know the solution. Right, we we got to heal from the intergenerational effects. We got to deal with depression, suicide. We got to do this. We got to do that. So I was relying on my mind the whole time, and I didn't see or understand his message until after he passed, unfortunately. And it wasn't until then I realized and, and I started learning from him more. And this, this book too. What's can, uh, I? It's blurry. What is it? Uh, Wabine. This you can get a copy from. A uh, copy of. Uh, Okay, thank you. The, yeah, the oh, Turtle my. Lodge. Yeah, well, oh. uh, this here is uh, Dr. Dave Christian, late Dr. Dave Christian Jr.'s uh, uh, legacy to the world. This is our ceremonies. This is our knowledge, our understandings, our teachings that our knowledge keepers have uh, passed down. Um, it includes many different indigenous nations, including Dakota, uh, Anishinaabe, and so it's a uh, very comprehensive and it, it, it provides a framework for uh, non-indigenous people as well to how to connect, reconnect here on Turtle Island, like based on our ways of life, based on uh, the laws that Gitche Manitou has given us to walk upon this earth. So I think it's a very, great resource. You're going to love what, uh, what he has uh, left behind. So, Thank you. Yeah, I'm definitely going to pick that up like right away. Thank yeah, you. and yeah, ceremony is everything. You're right about that. Uh, ceremony is everything. And if we are out to continue these talks and uh, like like an ongoing basis, I would love to. It'd be great to have these kind of discussions. And yeah, ceremony would definitely have to be a, a integral part of it, every single one, because it's a sacred space that we're creating yeah. here. It's kind of like what would happen in the Turtle Lodge, right? Yes, uh, exactly, exactly. I'm I'm kind of disappointed in myself that I had intended to do that, and then was like nervous with the first meeting to to bring it up and didn't know how you would respond so I didn't and you know lost an opportunity to to be in ceremony with you but that's okay that's learning in life yeah uh, now I mean know where we can go right that's, that's what the whole point imagine we had turtle lodges like this everywhere right we had a place where people can actually talk about these sorts of things this is amazing yes this is like this is part of my vision that's like I don't know how I get to be involved in that but that is that's that's it that's it for me hmm. for sure definitely I think damn <laughs> now, the more and more I think about it like the turtle lodge I believe uh the vision of it because back uh when uh, the late Dave Christian was uh, was uh, was alive, and I had the opportunity, privilege of meeting him, 
and learning from him uh, firsthand while hearing him not learning it didn't learn until way later but <laughs> um nice he, his uh <laughs> His, his knowledge, his teachings, I see the vision of the Tur Lodge being so important. I see, I understand now why the Tur Lodge and ceremonies are so important. And and even the Zeus conversation, like, is really becoming evident, becoming clear. Like, this is what needs to needs to happen, right? Yeah. Uh, if if somehow, some way, there these Tur Lodges can be built in like every single state, every single province, like, yeah, have it accessible, like more than one need be, right? I believe these should be should be built somehow. Well, this somewhere. this is to me a <clears throat> spiritual foundation of a uh, human connection with land that's missing, obviously, from from the from the settler community, from the non indigenous community. It's not just settlers, I guess, but non indigenous community. That connection with land is so needed and necessary for. Um, health for well-being for spiritual groundedness for like everything everything to me it's the foundation to all of life so yes I all right <laughs> what do we do now <laughs> awareness <laughs> awareness um thank you so much for this I would if you're open would love to continue these conversations um if you're up for that, that would be great. Definitely, yeah. Like this would this would be amazing. To, like, for example, even right now, like having this discussion, like opened my mind uh, to the possibility that this would be valuable and useful for a lot of people to have these kind of discussions, talking yes. about it. Like, in so many ways, not for both sides. Like for me yeah. as well. Like, like then uh, you know I would have uh, pride in being able to say, hey, I know someone, uh, a knowledge keeper that can bring some knowledge and right, and we can like say we continue on this becomes a thing where where there's so many people that are interested in sharing and learning from us and sharing and learn from each other right that we start dude, who knows what can come from from all of this i mean ah. well this is i this is part of my vocation and my vision is is teaching this to non-indigenous people like there is a desperation for it but i also think maybe that's not my place. Maybe it needs to come directly from indigenous people. Do you know, like, I don't want to overstep. I don't know. I don't know. Like it's fraught right now with, you know, proper relationship and overstep and racism and white supremacy and colonization. Like, I'm not sure what the right way forward is. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, I just, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah. So I think that's why there would be a lot of value in having turtle lodges, even though like a virtual turtle lodge, right? Where we yeah. come together virtually like this. We we do these ceremonies where we have uh um you know prayer and we have um that connection to spirit and when the discussions that we have that we have as rooted as much as we can rooted in ceremony and yeah, you know, with the intent that we're coming together in this spiritual way to reconnect with the land with ourselves with one another. Yeah. And to you know, yeah, I think it would be great. Just uh, who knows what if this is the start of it. Listen, right? like, I'm on board. I'm on board for doing this virtually and broadcasting as often as you want. This is like long mana nurturance to me. This is this is yeah. why I'm alive. Like this is it. This is the stuff. So yeah, sign me up anytime, anywhere. I'm there. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, totally. I would be down for that. Would, that sounds great. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, well, how about if you would like to send me kind of your ideas about what you see for this and we could like collaborate and then make a plan because it would be great to invite other people on, not just be you and I, not that I don't love this. I do. But yeah. also to have other people on who have um, different ideas and can share and you know what I mean? Like, just, yes, I totally hear. I totally yeah. hear. You. That would be great to have. I mean, it'll be so valuable, not only for uh, indigenous like uh, my, my people, but everyone. I mean, having this available and this information available doesn't happen off so often, right? People's only real interaction with us is right what they see on the media or right. Well, so. this is something that I 
I I don't know if it's overblown or like love bombing when I say this, but it's really important for me to express how important this is for me spiritually, how valuable this knowledge is. Like, <laughs> I feel like I'm standing on the doorstep of Indigenous knowledge and being like, please, like, feed me because I need this to be whole in this world. I'm not even like mincing words. This is how valuable it is. And I I can't be the only one. Like there's no way that I'm the only one that's desperate for this knowledge. Yeah, I think you're in the right place. I I I think for humanity to move forward, I believe that's what that's what we have to do. I mean the antithesis to racism to everything, right, is what we're doing here. And if we can do this and you know continue on as another people start doing is we have a turtle lodge even if it's a virtual one like we started doing that we started connecting in this way i mean we can create something else that other people who are looking for the same thing can find because there there is more like people like us i truly believe that i truly <laughs> sure, believe that. there has to be there's no way it's just us <laughs> there's no way yeah. yeah for sure okay what do you have in, what do you envision then let's talk about this right now what do you envision happening like what would you like to see and how often i'm very like like let's go with <laughs> with this <laughs> like let's set it up because why wait so yeah. what like what do you have planned like what's your what's your initial vision and to- saying it allowing that this can change we can both change our minds change our direction like it's all wide open for us to maneuver this the way it's best i think what could be a good idea is to make this like a uh, a weekly thing every sunday like this and uh once a like once a week like say we just kind of uh cover some basic stuff but over time maybe every other week or even every week we get someone else to join us third party that has a different perspective, right? It could be come from a come from a different indigenous nation, different spiritual leader, different teacher, or uh, like just a various in various fields that we come in, we we discuss nice. uh, various topics that uh, that are uh, intersectional that relate to not only right. indigenous sovereignty and uh, culture and spirituality, but also uh, uh, settler society and and uh, non indigenous peoples um, relation with us indigenous here in turtle island okay that's so i think yeah. we could have i think yeah. it, could, okay. it could just be something that, that this could go, will go with the flow type thing because a lot of these <laughs> things when it comes to spirits right it's yes. uh we can't force right we can want our minds to want something but the spirit leads spirit us spirit says something, something right? different <laughs> Yeah. yeah, yeah, we gotta go with our hearts, right? So it's true, it's true. That'd be great. I think that's fantastic. I'm super excited about this. Um, uh, do you have an idea already of people that you'd like to invite on? And I'm also wondering how much do you how much do you want um, Dr. Dave involved in this? As much as possible, I guess. Yeah. Because, okay. um, I like, I never I had the opportunity too. to learn. <laughs> <laughs> I never had the opportunity, and I feel uh, like uh, guilty that I I didn't take the time to learn from him directly when I had the chance, right? And it was because I, you know, lived too much up in my own mind. Thought I knew everything. I right? thought I knew the way. It, so I disregarded his teachings. But now, you know, I'm you know feeling that regret. You know, I'm starting to recognize you know the values of what he was trying to teach me you know. so yeah okay. like i said that's what he said the lot of longest journey was from the mind to the heart and it took me yeah. years or more to really take his lessons to heart and yeah so maybe this is his way of reaching out to me too you know uh yeah i don't doubt it actually the way mm-hmm. all of this uh has happened i have no doubt wow i'm pretty uh yeah pretty excited about this i hope it uh definitely goes somewhere good um you know what uh, i'm gonna be frank with you i i'm just excited that it's happening i don't want to put any ideas about where it's gonna go or what it's gonna be just because i want to just enjoy what's happening here this is finally me 
uh, living this vision that I've had for years and never been able to do anything about. Like, I, I, I don't know that you understand what this means to me. It means to me, if I could share, I, I probably have an idea. This is actually my vision uh, that, that I was given, I don't know how many years, maybe 14, 15 years ago or more. But uh, that's the vision that kind of guided me uh, through all my years, my life. And up, up, once I had that vision, that's what guided my life, pretty much became my purpose. But part of that vision was, was um, I was told I was supposed to lead everyone back to a certain place. And I understood that place to be like a spiritual place. It wasn't a physical place, but they said, you're going to lead everyone, everyone back here. And I was like, you know, how do I do that? Right. And I asked how, and, and I got one word answer, which was patience. And I thought it was telling me to be patient that I would one day be shown away. But it turns out that patience through patience, my patient answers, right. Um, <sighs> and my interactions of wanting to, bridge that connection be a bridge between white society non-indigenous society and my people right that is going to take patience for me to develop that relationship because i've noticed and I, the only reason why um, tiktok is filled with uh you know these um uh, very uh could be very biting uh videos and people see as very uh, abrasive videos but the reason why is because of tiktok algorithm that's what is promoted. You know, I talk about, you know, unity and love and all that and all this good stuff. And it's, it, you know, 300 views, 200 views, no messages get out there. Um, my objective when I ever, whenever I make those kinds of videos are, are twofold. Number one, to show, uh, to validate the justified anger of my people so that it is verbalized in a way that they can say, yes, I always knew that that was right, but I couldn't say it. I didn't, have the words for it but you're right that's you're right and they feel that that uh you know that validation so they get they they have their anger validated in one and the second reason is is ultimately in my own experience is that if you just come across nonchalantly um you know just try to educate someone like they're just uh, the information will go in one ear out the other whereas if i take what was said about us and realize and show them that actually the reverse is true. Uh, for example, like natives are lazy. That's a, that's a common one. The Indian grab a hoe industry actually existed from the 1950s to 1980s. And it decimated not only indigenous agriculture, where we enjoyed the most prosperous times, even throughout the great depression uh, because of our agricultural ability and our hard work ethic that the Canadian government, through the Indian Act, enacted laws where it decimated not only our agricultural industry, but then in order to support our families, uh, even children had to work 14-hour days in the hot sun, working the farmland of nearby farmers. Uh, the Indian grab industry, basically, because Canadians didn't want to do the labor necessary, it was hard work. They didn't want to do it. Sorry, you're going to... I do not know what grab a hoe is. You said that twice, like nonchalantly. <laughs> I just, oh. I have no idea what grab a hoe is. Oh, Indian grab the Indian grab a hoe era is is uh, what the the natives called each other. Um, Indian grab a hoe, uh, grab a hoe Indian. Uh, basically, when they were uh, recruited to work the farms, Canadian farms, uh, they were told to grab a hoe right, and get out there and start digging. So they call oh, themselves grab a hoe Indians, and okay. that's where the so I call it the Indian grab a hoe era it is when uh, from the fifties, the uh, eighties, our, our economy was decimated and we worked, we worked hard, even children, 14 hour days doing the work that farmers and Canadians didn't want to do because it was too hard. So the idea that you are, that indigenous peoples are lazy is the, the reverse was true. Actually Canadians were too lazy to work the farms that our children had to do the work for them, that they were too lazy to do. So the idea that, oh, natives are lazy. No, if you actually go to employers around across Canada, they will tell you that natives are the hardest workers they've ever had, that they love working with natives. You know, people that uh, that hire natives uh, from like nearby reserves or whatever, and they utilize us as uh, for employment. They said we're the hardest workers. I remember a uh, case in point, I was 14 years old. My first job was working South River Farms. 
And it was a potato, potato seed, basically cutting potato seed and on a conveyor belt where all day for about 12 hours a day or so. I was only 14 years old and I was the only person that completed the entire season. I was only 14. Yeah, I was working the old. I love to work. 15 years old, working 14 hour days with the Conklin and Gears on uh, working with the fairs. Yeah, that sounds Man, I, awful. <laughs> I loved it. It was great. I literally, 50 pound bags of ice and sugar, right? Like yeah. I, I was working. <laughs> You know, 30 degree weather and I'm like just like walking over with these bags of ice and sugar and I loved it. I don't know why. I was like, I love hard work. I don't know. It's like yeah, so anyways, yeah, the <laughs> my content on TikTok is the only reason why it's like that is because I, I have to get the message out there somehow, some way. And the most way effective way I found is to get people's attention in a way that kind of just shocks them out of their apathy, shocks them and gets them to a point where they're like like what the fuck? Like emotionally, for some people, it would emotionally disturb them, get them upset, right? But that is important because what that does, it plants a seed within their minds. There's a, a saying, a mind stretched to a new idea never regains its original dimensions. Mm -hmm. So when I mention something about, say, indigenous sovereignty or or I wrap something around, I say, you know, I, I use a term, uncivilized savage colonizer, right? What I'm doing is I'm actually wrapping that around a seed of knowledge, a seed of truth within it. So that when the emotional shock of it wears off, because they're not going to be able to forget that. They're going to remember the interaction that I had with them. And people have actually come back years later after I engaged with them on, say, Facebook. We had a, like a big, long debate. They would actually seek me out and they would uh, so at least a couple people over the past uh, um, three, four years alone. They actually came forward and said, I'm glad I found you again. You know, I want to apologize. You know, I didn't understand what you were trying to tell me before, but now I understand. You know, I'm sorry for, you know, not listening and not, you know, learning from me. But see, what I was doing was my method of, you know, I was a method to my madness, or I say something in a way that gets them emotionally invested in the conversation, in the debate. It's not because I'm trying to be petty or I'm trying to one up the other person, but because I recognize that in my experience in 20 years of doing this, that's the most effective way to get not only someone to pay attention, to continue to engage, but also to actually um, make that knowledge that I'm passing on to them imbued with emotion in a way that once the emotion dies down, that idea begins to bear fruit. They begin to understand and see, oh, actually, he's right. I see it now. Like uh, what that young man told me, you know, he was right. You know, hey, you know, I would feel the same way too if I didn't, you know, denied these truths, right? So then they have that, they acquire that knowledge in their own understanding, right? Mm -hmm. Without being told directly, hey, just believe this, this is true, right? They they have experientially able to understand and cognize what I told them because of the method of which I employed it on, which is, you know making them emotional and you know yeah even aggravating at some point right but the ultimately you're brave to do my, it you're yeah, brave to do uh, it because you've like what are you on fourth version four like yep, you get banned because people can't handle their feels not only that <laughs> but white supremacists like i'm like targeted uh oh, been docked uh, uh it's very dangerous what i'm doing but i've you know the path that i've led uh up until this point has prepared me for it. Holy so shit. if you say that the connection to spirit Right. That's why I believe the connection to spirit, connection to each other, connection to heart. That's what's going to save us. Yeah. You're right. You're right. Um, Miigwech. Tapad Lat. Thank you. Miigwech. Thanks um, for inviting me. <laughs> That's my new thing now is thank you in three languages. Um, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Tapadlat is thank you in Gaelic. Oh, wow. My name Dallas, I believe, is a Gaelic name, isn't it? It's... I just have to tell you, my husband is so not impressed that your name's Dallas because his first baby mama's name is Dallas and he's just he's getting post traumatic stress disorder every time I'm like, <laughs> well, I'm going to go talk to Dallas. He's like, God damn it. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs>